Hi, everyone. I, I guess I'm the live example of, 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 of a, a, a crisis in a, in a vaccination program and also um, how to gain the retrust and maybe looking forward on how we can uh, make our program more resilient in the future based on some of the experiences that we had with our HPV crisis. So now I'm calling it a crisis. It took us a, t a while because usually we do have a very robust uh, vaccination program and we, we really dislike the crisis part. So, but, but now coming on to the other side, it's, it's, it's more uh, a, a fair to say so. Okay. Okay, just to, to, to put a frame on, on the Danish childhood vaccination program, maybe coming back to the, the previous speaker, um, our, our program is, uh, the, the utility of the program is very easy. We have a, a, a free of charge vaccination program. It's, it's uh, gener generated uh, through the general practitioner's office. And, and usually we do have a very high uh, vaccination coverage uh, throughout childhood vaccines. And uh, we actually also have a very high degree of trust in, and, and I think that that was also what Heidi Larsen and her group could uh, measure when she came to our country. But usually a, a high degree of trust in, in, in our recommendation coming from the authority and from the government. And, um, and, and that means that, that usually our vaccination uh, uptake is, is above 90% for most of the vaccines and also above uh, around 95% for, for most vaccines and childhood vaccination program. For the HPV vaccine, uh, it was uh, one of our late introductions in 2009, and, and the, uh, that was for a girls only program, and, and we just uh, introduced it for boys as of 1st of September this year. Um, and, and initially it went, went uh, very well, uh, mirroring the rest of the vaccines in the program with an uptake around 90% uh, for the first dose uh, uh, for the girls. But then came along uh, a lot of uh, media attention, uh, a lot of uh, comments on adverse events, suspected adverse events uh, among girls who had uh, uh, medically unexplained symptoms uh, and they expected them to be uh, from the HPV vaccine. And since we had this very high coverage, and we even had a catch-up program for girls to the age 26, which also have a very, had a very high uptake, actually almost everyone was vaccinated. So, so linking this uh, on medically unexplained symptoms to the vaccine was, was kind of a, was it the easy route. And what happened in, in the media landscape was that the, the big broadcasting uh, networks took on this, uh, this uh, story. And what you see on the pictures uh, down on your left corner is a lot of ladies or girls who came forward with their medically unexplained symptoms. And, and this it was made a documentary of, of these uh, girls or ladies. And, and they were uh, actually uh, very personalized stories and very moving stories. And, and, and after this was broadcasted, uh, it like kind of perpetuated. So on all the social networks and everywhere, we just, we just experienced that, that, uh, that people now were using the search en engines such as Google to Google adverse events uh, on the HPV vaccine and not just the HPV vaccine or, or anything to do with, with uh, why, why we, we vaccinated in the first place. And what happened, this is a curve uh, showing the, the Danish vaccination uptake on, on the x-axis. You have the, the birth cohort, so you have to um, um, plus that with 12 because we give it at 12 years of age. And then we have the, the different lines is our uh, Nordic countries, uh, which shows you that Denmark is the only Nordic country that actually sees this uh, downward trend, this uh, rapid downward trend in, in vaccination uptake, and it's not really affecting our neighboring countries. I know from my neighbor uh, colleagues who are also here in the room, of course, they were really scared that, that this was going to rub off on them, and of course, they took their measurements, and as you can see, they, they succeeded, at least it didn't, it didn't uh, rub off. Um, unfortunately, we did export it to our Irish colleagues who also got the same uh, documentary uh, we, was reinvented um, in Ireland uh, with Irish cases and, and they had uh, kind of the same situation and we have had a very close collaboration with our Irish colleagues during this, this uh, period. 
But what was very uh, important for us was actually to take a step back and saying we actually do feel that we actually do have a, 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 a somehow robust program, program, but even though this happened to us. And it was very clear to us that what we usually do was actually not working this time. So, so to, to, uh, to, to, to come back to the communication part, we needed to learn something from this. So even though the first move you, you actually felt like being in my position was like running out and doing a lot of things, and especially doing more of what you usually do, this was not what we decided to do. We actually uh, decided to take kind of a scientific approach to this and actually do uh, to inform ourselves on, on what would be our next move. What was actually, uh, what was our, um, uh, the, the, the citizens, what do, did they actually want from us at this point of time? And actually, I don't think like we talked about, you, you, you do tend to think that, uh, I think it was the, the Philippine colleagues who just say, you tend to like want to throw a lot of information in their head, but that was actually what we had already done and it, didn't, it wasn't effective. So what we did was actually first to make a media analysis to actually see what was going on out there. What was the what was the talk about? What was the talk on social media, on the big broadcasting media? What were they talking about? And um, then we made focus groups, interviews with mothers, mothers uh, uh, and and uh, parents to see what was actually their knowledge and perception and attitude about the vaccine at this point of time. And what we experienced was that one third of the mothers was in, in doubt of whether to use this vaccine now and, and they were waiting. They were not really, they were hesitant, but they were not really anti the HPV vaccine. They were just very confused and very scared. And, um, and then we made an online survey of parents uh, just to, to, to reach more and, and to be able to qualify our, uh, our knowledge uh, in the field. And then uh, asking them a lot of questions on, on if, if you wanted to change your mind at this point of time, what would you need from us? What would be the messages that actually would work in order to make you reconsider? And uh, that was what we used the phase four to, to actually go out and test these messages in our focus groups and say, if we, if we told you this, uh, would it then make you uh, change your mind or would you prefer one of the other messages? And, and that actually gave us a bouquet of messages that then made the core of, of our campaign. And, and what was very interesting was that the parents kept telling us, well, you know what we need, we just need more information. You just have to give me that one study that shows me that I have nothing to worry about. And everyone who's been in science for decades and decades like me who knows that it's never gonna happen. And, and then they say, you don't have to tell us something emotionally, I, I will be persuaded by the cognitive knowledge. And that was so, um, um, uh, different to what we could see and uh, what was happening in the media landscape and also what uh, uh, our WHO colleagues and, and Cornelia Betch, who's, who's also leading one of the sessions this afternoon, what some of their studies saying that actually if you already emotionally made an, a choice, you cannot uh, by knowledge, make them change their mind. So, so we were very aware of that, that we also need to bring in some emotion into our campaign. So we started our campaign and it was launched in May 2017. Um, and one of the main messages we got from the parents was that you, you need to collaborate on this. All the authority needs to collaborate with all trusted partners in, in the Danish landscape. You need to use all the ones that we trust and, and you, they need to stand behind you. So that was what we did. We went out and we made this a campaign in partnership with our Danish Cancer Society and the Danish Medical Association. So on all our, all, all, all the messaging who came, that came out was, was with all these three partners behind. And, and then on top of that, we also made a network of, of a lot of other partners who were also uh, re-boosting uh, our messaging all the way. And then the elements of the campaign, it was a lot of elements, but of course, one of the things the parents said as well was that we need one page, one, one landing page to go into. We, we cannot shove around, uh, so we need to know that there's one landing page and that's where everything is in. And also they, they told us that you need to put in, uh, whenever you have uh, any kind of numbers, anything, you need to, to to, uh, to have a reference to that. And, and usually if coming from the authority, we chew everything and we make it very uh, easily read for the population. And they said, no, but if you go to the anti-vaxxers, they always have that one study that shows you that's why you shouldn't vaccinate. So you need to convince me that science is also behind you, your decisions. So we said, okay, we don't expect you to read it, but that's what we'll do. 
And then we made a Facebook page, and that's like the new baby for us, because that's not where we're usually uh, used to communicating, but that's what we did. So we uh, made a web page for the campaign, and actually it's, it's, uh, it, they got an answer 24-7, and, and there's nothing about excluding anyone, not even uh, with, with, with radical views. Everyone get a nice answer, and everyone gets a personal answer in there. So we would use our names, saying sincerely, Bullet, uh, answering you now. So it was in a very personal voice. And, and of course, it was a huge amount of work, but it's been very successful. And of course, then we had some some more um, physical material for the healthcare workers. We also did workshops built on, on, uh, on the work from the WHO group uh, on how to communicate with vac vaccine hesitant parents. So we made that around the country. And then we also made a lot of work with the press talking about uh, how to communicate on science and the science pyramid and talking about meta-analysis, randomized controlled trials is totally different to talking about case series and you cannot put them you know, head to head. So we worked a lot on that too. And that's all the, some of our other uh, network uh, colleagues who also treat and, and, and use all our uh, material. So if we focus on what we did on Facebook, because I know that's, that's some of the new things that we really, what we've done all the way through our Facebook communication, we make new uh, material for our, our Facebook page, uh, usually in the beginning once a week, now maybe every fortnight or something. And uh, what we do is that we communicate both to, to a heart and brain. And, and, and that was a bit new for us, that the heart communication, we were very scared whether the anti-vax and, and the community would, would uh, really take that on. But what we have done is, is use the personal stories. And, and the lady on your left is one of the ladies who, who actually, we did, we did this stepwise. So in the beginning, we, we, we put stories on women who've had, uh, uh, young women who've had only um, um, pre-cancerous lesions, but, but this lady is actually uh, terminally ill from cancer, uh, from cervical cancer, and that she's sharing her story. And I know our colleagues from, from Ireland is the same, and, and you probably, a lot of you have heard about Laura Brennan, who, who is there, uh, paid, yeah, doing a lot, of their champion in, in this field. We didn't have one champion, but we, we had a lot of these personal stories, and they were definitely the one who was the most engaging for the audience uh, on our Facebook. And then, of course, we did put all the science, and we did a lot of things. We also did a, a lot of fun stuff in there, and and a lot of engaging, and, and we had all, we, we measured whatever we did in there. So we measured what's the comment rate, was that positive, negative, neutral, and, and we're gonna make a publication on that, so, so how you can monitor that. And then we work with the press and, 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 and bringing out the, the positive stories, bringing back the focus on why we vaccinate, why would you put this into the program, because we want to prevent cancer. This is a vaccine against cancer, it's a fantastic, uh, achievement, and, and we put that into the scope, not only talking about the adverse events, but talking again about why do we want to vaccinate. And, and that was really effectful. They said, the, the ones who measured the, the media landscape said, well, you went from going from, from a, a horrible landscape where everything was negative, uh, they hadn't seen anything like it since something, uh, you know, whitewashing of the huge banks in Denmark, and then going to a very positive landscape in within one year. So, so that was quite amazing. And then, of course, we did other things. So, so we, we also used uh, uh, champions uh, outside uh, in the community, and this is a, a sports team uh, showing our... Oh, our uh, um, our messaging on their shirts and and then we had the Danish Cancer Society and that's one of the beauties working together they have a lot of volunteers <laughs> over 40,000 volunteers in the country and one of their uh, uh, that the things that they have to work on this year and the coming year is, is, is bringing forward the HPV vaccine. So you can use uh, the, this uh, enormous amount of volunteers who goes out in every corner of the country and, and talk about why we should vaccinate and they have all our pamphlets and everything with them. And of course we support them and we have made a team of young doctors who can go out and support them on their different activities. So, and then the last part, who, what was very, um, very crucial to us and, 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 and not maybe on demand from our side, but actually turned out to be a very positive experience, was actually talking to the very vocal parents. The parents who were uh, 
formed by uh, uh, the parents to the girls who had these suspected adverse events. And, and they were very critical, uh, to say the least. And, uh, and we had a meeting with them every month. And, and uh, we were very, in the beginning, very distant from each other. But actually moving forward, more and more time was spent on talking about what we could do for the girls and not so much about uh, why she came to be in this position and whether this was the vaccine or not, because we could never agree on that. But we could actually agree on, and of course, we would like to help and, and bring, uh, bring some uh, good into to her process in, uh, in the future. So actually, I know this is from literature, not usually what, you're, uh, <laughs> what you would recommend, but actually for us, it, it was a very positive experience, uh, although it was very, uh, it was tough work. So where are we now? This is the curve uh, showing the numbers of persons getting HPV vaccinated by calendar year. And as you can see now, moving into 2018 and the same in 2019, actually now more persons are being vaccinated than uh, before the crisis. And of course, that's because we have a, a catch up of a lot of the, the girls who waited. And what we see now is that some of the the, the birth cohort who was very low down to 25% is now uh, turning a corner around 80% uh, vaccination coverage, so, so that we are very proud of.